So this is how the report would eventually go, where if you also have these pink areas that you know you can have them black or white or green; it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I'm colorblind anyway. So this is pink is and it is pink, right? Yeah, pink is uh, non-viable. Yellow is viable and hibernating and green is viable and you know based on this at least you get a reasonably good sense and even the cardiac surgeons and the non-cardiac MR doing cardiologists would at least understand whether or not they need to revascularize or not. So this is pretty much how the report goes, goes and they get a clear sense of what needs to be done. This is essentially the first ever study that was done by Kim in adults. It was a landmark study. It changed everything about cardiac MR and viability, etc. And these, these numbers still stand today. So if you have a greater than 50% infarct, the chance of improvement is less than 20%. And if you have a less than 20% and 25% infarct, the chance of improvement is approximately 75 to 80%. Please remember, contrast enhanced CMR is the gold standard for viability imaging. This is essentially because MR shows us an infarct. When we inject contrast and image the patient with true face PIR or similar images, after five to seven minutes, anything that is infarcted will light up. White is dead. Okay, plus MR allows us in a reasonably reproducible fashion to assess contractility and systolic function. And you marry the two together and we can obviously assess um, viability very well. So remember, no other modality directly shows us an infarct and it takes 30 minutes. You don't need to stress the patient. Who are cardiac MR's competitors? <coughs> Pretty much uh, SPECT and PET, the nuclear medicine stuff. SPECT is just not good enough. As far as PET is concerned, it's not easy to do a cardiac PET. I mean, I run a PET CT and I, I don't do cardiac PETs. They're time consuming, the preparation is rigorous, and at the end, what do you get? You get information which is similar to that of an MR. It's not better. MR and PET, when PET is very well done, are similar. So why would you do a PET when the MR can be done in 30 minutes? The problem, of course, is that earlier we didn't have cardiac, M I mean, MRs which were equipped to do cardiac. Today, of course, most standard MRs are able to do decent cardiacs, and we don't have people who are willing to take the trouble to learn how to do this. And I think that's unlike, for example, cardiac CT, where the learning curve is very short. In MR, there is a learning curve, and the effort to learn the physiology, to figure out how to get good uh, cine images, how to understand RR interval, um, you know, all of that needs a little understanding and a little time to be spent on our part um, to, you know, get a sense of how to do all of this. But once done, this is a great technique and allows us to take a call on whether a patient who has already infarcted in the past is worth revascularizing or no. That is the question that cardiac MR answers. Now, for a long time, um, when I started cardiac MR in 2003, um, this was the killer application, right? Um, viability imaging. And this is what we used to do maybe four or five cases a month. But over a period of time, uh, the electrophysiologists, you know, started realizing that there is a lot of stuff, a lot of information that they need and can get from cardiac MR. And today, we don't do as much viability imaging. We're still stuck at five, six, maybe eight cases a month. But we have a patient virtually or two every day uh, with some form of cardiomyopathy because that's where <clears throat> today you will find that there is no competition as far as modalities are concerned with MR. Echo is just not good enough to assess the various cardiomyopathies. And as uh, Johan said, you know, the, he talked about a study about for sarcoid and TB. It is currently our biggest problem. Granulomatous cardiomyopathy is the name that we've given to it. And we'll run through that. And therefore, I'm spending more time on the cardiomyopathies because if you want to start cardiac MR, you should start with cardiomyopathies. Talk to your electrophysiologist. They're very receptive. They've been primed in their international conferences that cardiac MR is the modality to go with and they are searching for radiologists who are willing to work with them 
to do MR and give them the information that they want. So you search for the electrophysiologist in your city and then start working with them. Don't work with the, with the ischemia guys, right? They're cutthroat. It's tough to work with them. Everybody wants to, you know, either operate or stand. That's a different tribe. The electrophysiologists, I'm not saying they're bad or nice, but electrophysiologists, good to work with, no hassles, want to work with us. So who would you work with, right? So that's pretty much where it is. You divide the cardiomyopathies into primary and secondary. Primary, you have the genetic ones like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or ARVCs or non-compaction. You have the mixed ones where there's perhaps a genetic component and then based on that there's an insult which either leads to a dilated cardiomyopathy or some form of restriction. And they have the acquired ones which, you know, just hit the heart straight, all your inflammatory myocarditis, Takosubo, you know, Takosubo is a very fancy name for what used to happen in the Hindi movies, right? Um, son is Hindu, uh, goes and marries a Muslim girl, comes home, father says, <gasps> and he dies on the spot. That is Takosubo cardiomyopathy, right? Sudden stress and shock and your heart dilates and balloons. Apparently in the Japanese this happens a lot. I don't know why because they all marry into each other anyway. But <laughs> they call it Takosubo cardiomyopathy. I have never seen a case because they die before they come for a cardiac MR, don't they? At least in the movies they do. But we're seeing a lot of postpartum and that's very interesting. I don't know whether it's a shock of having a baby come out proper and fine, but you actually get peripartum and postpartum cardiomyopathy in the last six months we've seen about six of them and I, I don't know what the issue is but that's where we are. Secondary is when you have cardiomyopathy as part of a generalized process so you have sarcoid and TB, you have amyloidosis, you have endomyocardial fibrosis which in the southern part of India is extremely common. You have involvement of the heart with SLE scleroderma and you have toxicity based uh, stuff as for example with thalassemia. Let's start with the secondary, let's start with sarcoid and TB. Today, if we have a problem with cardiomyopathies, it is with sarcoid and TB. Typically, we'll get a patient not like this, okay? So this is a proven lung and nodal sarcoid. Then the patient has supraventricular tachycardia. You get, in this case, there's apical akinesia. There's mid-myocardial and epicardial enhancement. So we know that this is an infiltrative inflammatory cardiomyopathy. Combined with the fact that the patient has lymphadenopathy and is known sarcoid, this is typical sarcoid involvement. This we've already done as part, the, the study is the same as you would do for a viability imaging study. There's absolutely no difference or change, right? So that's, that's quite standard. The, uh, this is another patient who is a proven sarcoid again because we had, uh, I think, non-caseating granulomatous disease on the lungs as well. And I'll come back to this. And the patient has patchy enhancement. The question that I'm sure many of you probably quickly have is that how do you know this is not infarction? Is there a way to tell? All infarction is subendocardial enhancement, which then goes into the myocardium and up to the epicardium. Whereas anything that typically happens with an infiltrative inflammatory cardiomyopathy, you get mid myocardial and epicardial enhancement. And you can see that on the short axis. There are areas of, you know, different patchy areas of dyskinesia. You have abnormal enhancement. And all of this, you know, basically tells you that this is an infiltrative inflammatory cardiomyopathy. The problem we are actually facing these days is a situation where people, and I'll just jump to that, come with this kind of a problem. You have a supraventricular tachycardia. You have some lymphadenopathy. You have these abnormal areas of patchy enhancement and till about two, three years ago and actually till about this particular case, we would call all of these sarcoid. Now this is a complete reversal of what happens in the lung. In the lung, every shadow is TB unless proven otherwise, whatever it may be. But that's how our minds work or the minds of the treating physicians work. In the heart, we're primed to believe that every inflammatory process with lymphadenopathy is sarcoid because sarcoid is very well known to affect the heart. Well, you know, this particular patient, the physician said, I don't believe this is sarcoid. He put him on anti-TB treatment and the patient improved dramatically. And we've now started seeing that these are patients where sometimes you don't have an answer. And more importantly, tuberculosis in the myocardium behaves in the same manner that sarcoid does. 
There's very little data on this. What we did find when we went to some of those articles written in the 50s and 60s and some old TB textbooks on autopsy studies, they have described TB granulomas and TB infiltration of the heart, which is not like this. Okay, the, um, This is a gross case where you have tracheal involvement, lymph nodes, you know, infiltration. This almost looks like a lymphoma but turned out to be tuberculosis. This at least can be diagnosed. The problem is these patients, how do you know what they are? And guess what? So we do lim you know, lymph node biopsies and we're very good at this kind of stuff. And the pathologist almost invariably says, non-caseating granulomatous disease of indeterminate etiology, it is not possible to differentiate between tuberculosis and sarcoidosis on histopathology. So what do you do? It's a problem. I, um, our people then use all kinds of clinical parameters to try and differentiate and then sometimes like with lymph nodes in the chest, you put them on both anti-TB treatment and uh, steroids and then cross your fingers and hope for the best. But please remember this, that we have an entity called granulomatous cardiomyopathy, which is among the commoner cardiomyopathies that we are seeing in practice. Patients present with varying forms of uh, tachycardia. They have lymph nodes in the chest and they have infiltrative processes occurring within the heart. Okay, so just remember this and the, the problems still remain. I just threw this in. This is not a cardiomyopathy, but anybody, anywhere in the body, the diagnosis remains the same, right? High data, right? It's just to show that. We get case reports of the reason I put this in is you get unusual. The other day we got a, ca a case report in the IGR of a hydatid cyst in the testis saying that it's very rare, it occurs once in, you know, being reported last 10 years ago. And our comment was, so what? Hydatid looks the same everywhere. You don't have a problem making the diagnosis. Why should it get published? And this is one of the things about case reports in the IGR. I'm completely digressing. But if it's a commonly, easily diagnosable tumor, even if it occurs in the hypophysis or the pineal body, it's not going to get published. Because in the end, hydatid is hydatid wherever it is in the body. I don't know why I went there, but nevertheless. 